I'm Brett Klein with Eisenhower Health and also with the Board of Directors for Heart PS. And um, I'm just opening up and just reminding everybody that we have sessions on the first floor. Uh, everything that's on the first floor is on the second floor. We have signs in front of every door that is indicating where that um, breakout session is. The breakout sessions do not move. The times move on each one. So look at your schedule or look at the signs in the lobby. Um, but if you are going to say comic art, comic art will always be in the room that is by that door. Um, so make it as simple as possible. And uh, what else? We have lunch around 12 o'clock and that will be set to go. And we have a cocktail reception at the end of the day once our keynote with Mark is done. With Mark S. King. What does that stand for? Is Mark? I know, I don't know. That's a question that we have to ask. Steve. Steve. Okay. I had Scott. It was okay. Steve. Everybody say hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Hi. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Taylor, our executive director of Heart PS, and he'll kind of introduce the rest of the day. Yeah, and a big thank you to Brett and everyone at Eisenhower for hosting us and making this all possible. Brett threw his back out trying to pull this together. It's been a huge amount of work, and uh, he deserves a huge uh, round of applause for everything. Uh, so this is the reunion project. So we thought we'd start out by introducing the reunion project. Um, Matt, let me know when you're ready, and uh, you can talk a little bit about the group and how we got started and, and who we are and what we're going to do, and that will segue into Greg. Uh, <laughs> okay. Every day is like survival. <laughs> oh my God. Right? That's a good tip on that. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Matt Sharp. I'm one of the founders of the Reunion Project. I'm really thrilled to be here. I, I hadn't planned to come, and uh, last week I was uh, speaking to Jeff and he said, are you coming? And I, it dawned on me, I live in Berkeley, so I was like, why not come down and, and uh, be with you all today? I'm really thrilled to be here. Uh, I just want to give you a little bit of background about the Reunion Project. Um, you, you, how many of you are familiar with the Reunion Project and maybe have been here in the past two iterations? And last March, okay, and then we did one, when was the first one? Um, two years before that. So who was in the first one two years ago? Okay, so a lot of repeats and some new people. That's great to see. Um, so we, the Reunion Project was, um, we really started with, I really consider it a gift. The whole project is as a gift to not only us in creating what we're doing in each of the cities that we go to, but it's a gift to the community and a gift to the survivors. And what, we're, what we really try to do, what I recognized um, when I saw Jeff's ad for this, this weekend was it just dawned on me that the Reunion Project over the past four or five years has really created an opportunity for communities to create their own projects and their own um, really survivor skills, survivor opportunities to continue to grow and to get, continue to, to live into the future the way we want to live and the way that we are lucky to be here to live and, and, and enjoy that. And so it was just like, I, I kind of like, this is a dream that we fulfilled, that we, we are we're fulfilling, we're still fulfilling it. And that is to come in to cities and introduce us and help <coughs> each individual community to build what you guys have been able to build here in Palm Springs, which is really the model. I just want to stop and give you all a plan. I have to hear that. <laughs> it starts with you know a few people to mobilize, bring people together in a social setting, to recognize all the issues that we um, are experiencing as we grow older, and also the, uh, just the issues of you know living 30 years and all the buildup of trauma and, and also the buildup of joy in this event that we were able to be here today. Um, and so I guess with that, I'll, I'll say just one more thing. We're, we're uh, creating a flyer as we speak that's going to talk about some of the things we're doing this year. 
we have a lot of our uh, future projects um, are going to be in June. So they just happen to end up all in June this year. June 1st, we're, we're uh, collaborating with APLA in Los Angeles to do their own sort of in-house reunion project. And I think Jeff's going to be there, right, helping with that. And some other, and Greg, oh, you're going too, right? I think so. I think so. <laughs> we, these things just happen spontaneously. I don't know. And then um, we're ex really excited to work with um, an employment project in New York with Mark Mizrock. What's the name of, of his project? Do you know Jennifer? He's, um, I always forget, forget the name of it. We'll, we'll tell you later, but he's created a, a national employment project uh, for, for survivors and for people with HIV, but uh, he's working with us to create a specific day-long um, workshop to help people get back into employment and all the issues that we're dealing with in terms of returning to work or, or just maintaining our work and all the benefits that we may lose or gain from getting back into work. So we're doing that with Chicago, um, the uh, uh, 14th and 15th of June. of June, so that's two weeks later, we'll be doing that in uh, Chicago. Anybody up in Chicago in June in, in that time of the year? And then, yeah, right. and then we're working to, yeah, and then we're working with um, uh, Washington, D.C., where we're doing uh, a new, uh, the first reunion project 1.0 with the D.C. people um, and that's going to be June 22nd. And then our last, we're doing, we're committed to do four projects this year, and the last one is going to be in, in New Orleans, sometime in the, in the last part of the year. So with that, we, we're building uh, and creating a new project with uh, T-PAN in Chicago called Positively Aging, and I uh, look forward to seeing more about that in the future. So with that, I'll turn it to Greg. Thank you. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna invite our friend Jill. How many people know Jill Govard? Okay, then this is a good, okay. So I would like Jill, for the fun of it, just to do a little bit of an introduction, just because I love her so much, and I just, I feel like she's like the guardian angel of um, Palm Springs. I just, it isn't, she just has this really great vibe, really friendly, like a little bit New York, and then a lot of California. Like she was raised in Berkeley and there's like tofu and everyone's wearing earth shoes or something. And you're old if you know what an earth shoe is. So I right? just wanna, I wanna do like a, a shout out love fest to Greg because I just think he is incredibly awesome and what he has to share with you this morning. Those of you who haven't had the pleasure of hearing him before, you will really enjoy and be inspired by what he has to say and the, the work that he's doing, which is just so incredibly amazing. So I'm just gonna tease you with that and, and uh, turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Jill. Thank you. Thanks for having So, um, can we turn the lights up a little bit so that it doesn't feel so sleepy? <coughs> Not mine, theirs. <laughs> now it's blinding. Um, I want to start by saying, number one, it's nice to be in a, well, it, it, see, I'm judging. So I'm going to introduce myself as this older gay man. And, um, and I'm very judgy because I just last week was invited to go and speak at an all boys Catholic school in Boston. Okay, thank you. More, more like, uh, like more noises and like terror. So let me just say, it was going into the belly of the beast. And it was the nightmare of every gym class. I feel like, I know that there were athletic gay people. Congratulations, whoever you are. But I was more, I was more like a picnic blanket with about six girls combing Barbie's hair. Like that was like fucking perfection to me as to how to spend that afternoon. And to go back to these guys, and I just saw it, it was an auditorium like this where everybody was up in front and you just, you're seeing everybody. And it just looked like, in my mind, it was all straight white guys who were all saying, as everybody in the gym class had been chosen, okay, we'll take Cassin. That's what it felt like. Everybody was just like, 
okay, we'll take that faggot. I was a little bit chubby. It always turned into shirts and skins. How many guys had shirts and skins in their thing? Biggest freaking nightmare. If you are the one that's always shopping in the husky department, is there a husky department? That's the old days. So everyone, like, I'm timing myself, okay? Like, Earth shoes, the husky department. So my little boobies are always going around because I was always a skin. I was like, how the fuck does that always happen that I'm a skin? I'm like, I need some people, I want like a tube top just to be dribbling the ball down the blocks. I just, and I live right across the street. This is, we're gonna get into some real work, but this is just me like relaxing. We lived across the street from the school. So I would try to use the excuse of, I left my gym stuff at home. The guy would be like, he would open the window and be like, that's your goddamn home right there, Cass, and go get your gym stuff. So, um, so coming and being with a warm and loving audience and an audience of my people, um, it's just such a refreshing thing. And I wanna, um, I wanna say the thing that I think is what, what I feel like for me is so important about the Reunion Project. I feel like as long-term survivors, okay, I wanna just ask, how many people identify as long-term survivors? Raise their hands. Thank you. And I wanna also say in that, how many people identify as a long-term survivor that may be HIV negative, but live through the days of the epidemic? Would you raise your hands? The people that are the allies that live, that walk through this with us, thank you. So the work that we, the one, one of the aspects of the reunion project that we do, and what I do with honoring our experience, um, we do it two times a year, and um, it's wonderful. And what it is, is recognizing the power of story and the power of community. I think that what we see now is that as with long-term survivors, one of the epidemics that we have is the epidemic of loneliness and isolation. How many people agree with that? How many people, how many people have experienced that, raising hands? How many people have, ex so this is nice to see what's in the room. So I just want to say like, feel free to look around the room. How many people have experienced loneliness and isolation that has led to depression as a result of their HIV? Thank you. How many people, hmm, how many people, this is honor, so what I want to say is when I'm asking these questions, I want to honor what's in the room. I want to honor all that we are holding when we walk into this space. We come in, a lot of times we come to these workshops and we want to hear information and stuff like that, but what I want to recognize is that when we come together like this, it's a celebration, it's a circle where we get a chance to share some of our stories, but at some level it's also a memorial. Like so many of us are carrying the people who we've lost. And so I just want to honor that all of this is brought into this group. When we come together, we're coming together to nurture and heal one another. One of the most profound things that we understand is that the sharing of stories, the witnessing of our experience, the telling of our experience, both the giving of that gift, the sharing of our experience, the sharing of our stories is a gift that we give, but the witness, the witness of just honoring and saying your story matters. That's why we started to come together. I want to say that there was a parallel that they recognized with people that lived through the Holocaust. I love this parallel. The Holocaust is this sacred, such a unique, horrid experience. But we have so much to learn from it. And what we saw with social, with studies reflecting on the Holocaust and the survivors saw was that the Holocaust survivors went through this horror. And I want to parallel it to ours. They went through this horror that was so hard that they were holding on, white knuckling, through this horrible storm. And then the storm finally settled. And then they took their time to piece their lives back together. And then it became kind of normalized. Their lives became normalized. Reflect on how this has been for us, that our lives became normalized. And then we got to the point, and I swear to God, this is what was the words that was said often with friends on Castro Street bumping into one another. We'd say, it seems so long ago, did that really happen? How 
how many ever had that thought? Did that really happen? So what they found with the Holocaust survivors, that it was decades that with a group trauma like that, to go through it and then to be jumping back into processing that was not really possible. So that it took decades. And I feel like it's almost textbook that the, that the, the LGBT and the HIV, the HIV community, is reflecting the same. That it was decades that we, that we held on through this storm, we held on through this horrible time, the dust started settling and all of a sudden we're like, oh my God. So I just want to say that here it is, that it was like two and a half decades afterwards that we feel like the dust has kind of settled and all of a sudden, about five years ago, all of these long-term survivors, like this kind of understanding of ourselves as a cohort, as a community of people, people with a shared experience, a unique and profound experience that very few people can understand. But what I'd like to say about this, when we come together, a unique and profound experience that very few people can understand. But we can. When we walk into this room, our shoulders should drop a little bit, the forehead should soften a little bit, and then we recognize that even if we're complete strangers, walking into this room, your story's known your stories felt, and that you're seen. Oh, I love this part. And that what you walk through matters. So I want to take a moment. I do this at every, so I am, I'm a New Yorker. I was raised in New York and Long Island, and in 1980, I moved out to California. So I'm this perfect blend of cynicism and really kind of <laughs> new agey, Scary. And um, so, in, I can't, I, you think after 30 years to tell my goddamn story and have a better description of myself, but I don't have a better one. And, um, and so, what I have to say is that when the epidemic started, I initially what I understood was I had to bring people together. It was what I needed, what I did for myself. I had to bring people together. I had to get over this. So, I, was te I tested probably. Somewhere in the mid 80s, somewhere in 84, 85, something I found out that I was positive. And, um, and, I, and in 87, I was living in Europe, I came back in 87. And I went to, um, remind me that I'm going to do the meditation. Remind me that's what this, this whole preamble. Um, and I came back to San Francisco, and so it was at a time when there was no treatments. There was time when, how many people know Louise Hayes' work? Raise your hands, or all that new age. <laughs> I love old people. God bless you that you know that. You go to goddamn high school kids, they don't know shit about history. Anyway, and that's the important history. I mean, where do we go when we have no one to rely on? You go to an ex-model who's handing you a teddy bear and telling you to hug it and say that you love it. I mean, times were tough, right? So if that's all we have. So in those early days, I went to those kind of workshops. I went to another workshop that was taught by a woman named Sally Fisher. How many people have heard of Sally Fisher? Okay. So I went to Sally Fisher's workshop. It was 1987, probably. It was in San Francisco. It was at a time when I was still processing being HIV positive. I was walking around and I felt like I was a horrible, horrible, diseased pariah. I hated being HIV positive. When anyone would cruise me or look at me on the streets, I'd my thought was, like I held back, like I felt guilty, like I could kill you with what I have, I could kill you, it's horrible. I went to this workshop, I would go, I would grasp at anything that was, that could be deemed as helpful. I did Chinese medicine, I did, you know, every kind of thing, um, all the vitamins and everything like that. And I went to this workshop and this woman, some guy said that he had really had some incredible experience and he really felt like he had healed. And so I went to this workshop and I sit in the front row and it's just about 20 HIV positive guys. Some guys really, really sick, some guys looking just regular like me. And I sit in the front row and I'm gonna be the best student. And each person, she says, she goes very simply, we're gonna all stand in, up in front of the room and we're gonna all tell our stories. And she's like, 
whatever is your thing to share, we don't have, we have the whole weekend, so whatever is your thing to share. So I'm sitting there and I'm just like feeling like so, like I said, poison. And the first guy gets up and tell his story. And some people are going from like their birth and some people are telling the story of them with a best friend. Just a story after story. And the first guy that tells the story, I'm like listening to him and I'm like, oh, I love that guy. And then the next person that gets up there and they tell this story, this one I'll never forget, this guy just talked about a walk around the lake with his best friend and a bird coming and diving into the lake. And I'm like, my God, I love that guy. And then the next guy, and I'm sitting in and I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm listening, like, when does the healing come? And the next guy went up and I said the same thing, I love that guy. And the next guy and the next guy. And all of a sudden it came to me. Oh my God, I love these guys. I love all these guys. Oh, they're so innocent. You must be too. It was the power of story, the power of witnessing one another, that we are so insanely inspiring and connected to one another that we deeply need one another. And there is something, I don't understand what it is, that I can have a workshop and we have people that come in off the streets out of tents and we have women of color, we have folks that are, it became HIV positive a year ago and we have people that have been positive for 35 years. And we all sit in a room and this one person can tell their story and you can be lifted. It can be where this woman walked through fire talking in front of her daughter of the, year, of the years that she spent in a shopping cart and a box in the mission, going into the hotel on the corner and turning tricks and turning tricks to feed her habit, and that she's able to tell that story and that everybody gets lifted and says, holy shit, if she can do this, I can too. So I wanted, okay, that was a good introduction, the meditation. So why don't we, I want to do this thing where we just take a moment to just let ourselves connect with one another. I feel like it's the most important thing. So, another thing. There's a thing called the Harvard study. It's the longest wellness study. It's a study that they started at Harvard 80 years ago. You, you've read this, Jill? It's such a beautiful study. I mean, the, there's a TED talk about it, and the guy's incredible. And it talks about, so all this stuff, like in the old days, I make fun of myself that I was like doing these groups when Matt and his friends, Matt just left, I'm gonna give him a big compliment. Matt was like the cool kid. I was the new agey one that was like, I had a crystal in my pocket, probably a rabbit's foot in the other, and I was like, please don't let me die this. Matt was in a leather coat, hanging out at Cafe Flora, and like, you know, pounding on the FDA or whatever the hell, you know, everything, you know, just fighting like a, a, a mad dog. And I was more that I wanted to bring people together. I wanted to find this place of community. And um, so the Harvard study, it was kind of like this way of affirming all of this work that we naturally did. We naturally were drawn to one another. That in the old days of the epidemic, this community that had been maligned that was told that they were sinners, that was told that they were evil, that was told that um, they were perverts, that weren't supposed to be around children, couldn't get married, all these things, that this community that then gets besieged by this virus, this epidemic. And when we reached out for help, we had a finger wagging at us and telling us how horrible we were, that we did, that we deserved it, that people wanted to put us away, and instead, what we recognized was that it was only us that we could rely on. And we turned to one another. And this community of people that was told how worthless and valueless we were, responded in the most beautiful and noble way. The way we cared for one another, the way we fought for one another, transform the way healthcare is delivered in the United States. It's absolutely amazing we did, and I feel like in this time, it's probably one of the most growth-filled, and that, that horror 
that inhumanity could bring so much humanity out of us. The way that we responded, please nod your heads or see that you said that you hear that. Right, that the way that we responded, the way that we cared, the kind of love and the kind of response that we had when we had one friend in the hospital, one friend that we're planning the memorial service while we're going to the doctors ourselves, just an incredible, incredible time. So, um, so this Harvard study acknowledged that as important as where you are in obesity, in smoking, in um, high blood pressure, um, that on equal par was having a supportive social community, a social support network. That this work, that we come together, we have to recognize that we are knitting a community. Many of us come from different places. We've got so many people, right? Our transplants here. But even in our young years, we were transplants from all these small towns and other cities, and we didn't have anybody but our community that we built, our family that we built. Here's a question I want to ask. This is what happens, a question that I ask in the retreats. I want to ask, how many people lost a best friend at the epidemic? Raise your hands. You need to look around the room. How many people lost two of their best friends during the other day? Raise your hands. How many people lost three of their best friends? Raise your hands. And now this is the question. How many people lost the circle of friends they had Thanksgiving with? that they went on vacation with and they thought that they would grow old with. How many people lost those people? I want you to look around the room. We are relying on one another to save one another's lives. And we can do it by the building of community, by the knitting together of community here. This is what's happening. The last time I was here, it was so incredible, the love that was in the room. I was like, oh my God, I have a daughter and two grandbabies, so I can't leave Northern California. But when I come into this space and there is this shared experience, it's sacred ground, people. And I just want to say, like, our stepping outside of our comfort zone to really engage, I want to say that when we, when we first were starting the long-term survival movement in San Francisco and I was doing the retreats, I do this thing honoring our experience of life there. And, um, oh, the first workshop we did, we finally had to say, we had that conversation about who lost, who lost, who lost, and then we had to say, oh, guys, this is first grade, and this is the first day of class. And everybody here just wants one new friend. And that's the work that we did. It's the work that we did and we made ourselves commit. Every week we were like, we want to show our hands. Come hella high water. Even if the Kardashians or some specialist on, you can't not be here next Tuesday night. Will everybody be here? And we made ourselves promise. And at the end of it, so funny how you get emotional to think about it. We had 21 people that had signed up for this sixth Tuesday night thing. On the sixth Tuesday, we had 22 people. And the one guy stood up at the end of it and he cried, this one buddy of mine, actually Vince, who runs 50 plus in San Francisco, an incredibly successful program. And he cried and he said, this is a first. We always start these things and everybody dribbles off. He said, this is a first. We are showing that we matter to one another that we hear for one another, that we want to be there, to be the witnesses, the friends, the loved ones of each other, that we can't do it alone. It was so, so powerful. So do me a favor. I want you to, we're gonna do a little meditation thing, so close your eyes, and if you're sitting next to someone, and take a nice deep breath. Let me find my little thing. Okay. We know we're in California now. Close your eyes. Take a nice deep breath. I want to hear that breath. You turn on this music. And 
just for a moment, just be feeling ourselves breathing and feeling ourselves present in the room. <coughs> oh, and just for a moment, be considering, we walked into this room alone, but we walked into this room with purpose. We walked into this room to come together, to join together, that none of us is alone. And if you're sitting next to people, just gently take the hands of the people on either side of you. And if you're not sitting next to somebody, you're, you're with us. You are holding the hands. There's a group of people gathering that are committed to creating community Mutual support, leaving no one behind, opening their hearts and being part of the healing. Bring any shyness or self-doubt as your gift to be offered up. We all walk into this room wanting the same thing, to be seen by another, seen as in felt, heard, understood, held, treasured. And in that being seen, healed, that's the power we have for one another today. We hold these hands of the people on either side of us, but we hold the hearts of everyone in this room today, this day that we spent together. We hold the hearts and all that these hearts contain. The unfathomable losses, the incredible sadness and depression, the amazing resilience and courage of what it takes to continue on. We hold these hearts and if you hold these hearts, if you hold these hearts of every person in this room, so must your heart be held. Let yourself for this moment right now, let everything in that heart of yours be held, that it's shared. It's shared by the people in this room. It's shared by so many people with this shared, profound experience that we have walked through. today as this day that is sacred ground that we see strangers that we acknowledge one another if it's someone that we don't know that we acknowledge that we introduce ourselves let this be our work today that we don't only sit back and think oh I'm too shy I'm but instead that we reach out how can I make a difference in someone else's life, we have no idea what each of us carries. But that we reach out and that we make this place sacred ground for building community, for building friendship, for building a deeper sense of connection and respecting what we have walked through. It matters. And it has made us and the people that we were born to be so much of who we are now is what we've walked through and what we've learned and how we've grown. It's a debt of gratitude to 
to all that we have lost, but also a debt of gratitude to all that remain, we who remain. Let's take a nice deep breath together, give a squeeze of those hands. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to go to the next California level of standing up and welcoming the people around you by giving them a hello and a hug and introducing yourself and make sure you introduce yourself to some new people. So go ahead, stand up, wake up. I'm going to give you another coffee. Put on that dance music. Go ahead, don't be shy. You've got to move around to the news. This is the church now. Come on. Louder. Go around. Come over and eat some here. So one of the things we talked about at the retreat is the power of sharing. And that when we talk about sharing, how many people go to recovery groups? Raise your hands. Okay. How many people have been to support groups? Raise your hands. Okay. So one of the things we use, we use this term share. Share is literal. It's not C-H-E-R. Okay. It's share. S-H-A-R-E. And it is an act of generosity. So what I want to ask. Thank you. This is what I want. I want the group, I want some folks in the group to take that risk and to share what it is that they come for. I'd like to remember, what are we here for? To acknowledge that we are here for whatever. Okay, so I want to leave it up to you guys. What is it, I want to acknowledge what we're building here when we come together. I want to acknowledge what it is that we need when we come together as a community. So who's going to be the one that's the generous one and start the sharing? Please. Thank you. Please stand up and say your name. My name is Andrew. Oh. Everybody say hi, Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Andrew. Uh, just hearing you talk, you know, I lived in San Francisco from 78 to 93, and a lot of the memories I have, I have buried. It mm. reminds me a lot of the friends of my contemporaries who went to Vietnam. But, you know, I hear things about uh, Louise Hay, you may remember Matt Garrett in Lady in Light mm -hmm. Ministry. Kwan Yin, acupuncture. All of that. Uh, all of that. And um, it's just interesting how, just like you said, never having been through the Holocaust, you, know, you go through something and it's so awful, and then you go live your life and your time passes. And I know for me, I, I really don't think about a lot of it mm. because there is such a well of emotion. It's very painful. That this is, uh, and I'm sure my story in that way is not unique. That's it. This, that's generosity right there. And I want to say, you just gave a gift to the entire room, and you said to the room, I trust you, and we all, we all got that gift of being that witness. So I've been doing this work forever. I feel like we laugh most of the time on the retreats, and there are tears. And this buddy of mine wrote a poem 100 years ago, and the best line of that poem is, our tears are liquid prayers. Thank you for sharing that. I have a buddy of mine who said, I believe what I should do with my experience of the epidemic is what my people did. It's like claiming that all Jewish people, he said, we close that door and lock it. And I'm like, no, not all of your people, no. Some of them said, I have to share this story in honor of everyone lost and in honor of what I walked through. Please, let's hear from someone else. One of the gifts of being together. 
or acknowledging what we do when we come together in community. Who else? Please. Say your name. Ron Rogers. Say hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. I was diagnosed in Los Angeles. I'm from New York. What I found when I moved to Europe, you didn't have community. You didn't have the sort of gay community or HIV positive. In Spain, they treat you as if for sure. In fact, if you had the best healthcare coverage here for HIV positive people in the world, hands down. I moved to Germany. You just don't have the support for so I don't feel Take care of your psychological issues. Um, make sure you go to the gym. Make sure you walk with that. Mm. In Spain, you see people like look at that, but they're heroin addicts. Mm. But they're energy positive. Mm. So we're giving this other sport. Mm. They need mm. have nutrition, mm. psychological, everything else. And people also talk about this. Well, I never had this issue of being um, pariah. Mm. I have more difficult to eat cars coming out. Each of you positive, but I never had to this game. I grew up in Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. So, Sweet. But, I felt being positive was a gift. Mm -hmm. With life to its fullest. I was 19, I had a career. I, mm -hmm. But I still went to school. I went to USC, I went to public schools. Mm -hmm. I got student loans. Bought a house, did a mortgage, 24. Mm -hmm. Don't even have to die in six months. I felt it was a gift. But because of the people around me, support of family, support of friends, mm -hmm. I am probably an enigma. I never had one person I knew yeah. die. Right. No one. So I have that kind of weird mm -hmm. that I saw you know, mm -hmm. in the community that were my friends. Mm -hmm. Very well close. Patience. Thank you. So anyways, keep having this kind of structure and mm -hmm. organization, support. It's unique. Right. Yeah. It doesn't exist anywhere else. Exactly. I, that, thank you for saying that because that's one of the things I wanted to say about Palm Springs. It's like, this is the holy ground. Go to one of those other places that you're like, <laughs> um, Anyone else want to share before we go? Anyone over here? Any of the women? Yes. I'm, I'm Marge Mark. So, what's your name? Marge. Everyone say hi, Marge. Hi, Marge. Hi, Marge. after lunch, I want to just read this one part. It's so beautiful and so famous to people. Here. I know. See? The gift of going old. I didn't know what I was praying for. <laughs> to be blind, to need a facelift. You pray and then you say, like, I also want to be married to a cosmetic surgeon. <laughs> Okay, so this is, um, it's the final scene in Angels in America, and it's just beautiful, and you just can't hear it enough. So if you remember in the Angels in America, how many people haven't seen Angels in America? Raise your hands. Have, okay, good. So Angels in America, it's all about AIDS, and this guy has, you know, been very sick, and it's this big, tortured, 10,000-hour play. And then he winds up in, it's a marathon, it'll kill you, you know, like if AIDS it'll kill you, then the play will. And, um, so beautiful. 
And the final scene, I remember seeing the very first time that it was it played in San Francisco, I saw it with all my friends with HIV. And this play, like I say, is a marathon. And the last few minutes of it, the guy breaks the third wall and turns to the audience. And he says, looking at the audience, looking and making eye contact. He's the, he's the character with AIDS who is standing with his friends in Central Park and looking out over all the bare trees with a little bit of snow and a little bit of haze. And he says that this is what the park looks like in winter. I've had AIDS for two years now, and everyone told him that he was be dead in a year and a half. He said, but I want to see these trees when they are green and glowing in the afternoon light. And he looks towards everybody, towards the audience and says, this disease will be the end of many of us, but not nearly all. And the dead will be commemorated and will struggle on with the living and we are not going away. We won't die secret deaths anymore. The world only spins forward. We will be citizens. The time has come. And he reaches up his hand and he says, bye now. And he swept his hand across and he goes, you are all fabulous creatures, each and every one. And I bless you. More life the great work continues. And it continues. And it did. When he said that, none of us believed it. And it did, and here we are, commemorating and honoring all that we've walked through, all that we've become, all that we've become that we honor ourselves, all that we've become. So grateful to be here. I want to say thank you, and we'll see you after lunch. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. So just a reminder, um, go to the breakout rooms. They're on the second floor.